Well, good morning, South Loop community. My name is Noah Chung, and I am the Near South Church Planting Associate Pastor here in the South Loop location and also the Bridgeport location. You know, we're so excited to have you all join us for our family service. There will be elements for the children for singing and during the sermon. And so kids, please do join in, tune in, listen in as we spend time worshiping God together in our homes. You know, at Park, we exist to be a biblical community where the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms lives renews the city, and impacts the world. And as a church community, we desire for each of you to join us to be involved in this vision for the sake of the gospel and for God's glory. And one of the best ways to do that actually is to join a small group, to join other believers who are getting together virtually, but also getting together in smaller cohorts of three to four hopefully in person if able, to disciple one another, to grow together, to pray together, to study the word of God together. I would ask that you would please join us. More info is on the website and also um, in your emails as well. You know, I want to share one big news for us at South Loop. You know, for a season we've been meeting outside, but with the weather, as you can see today, it's getting colder and wetter. Um, We are officially moving our Sunday gatherings indoors. You know, as a team, we have consulted with and also worked on making sure we can do this as safe as possible while also prioritizing the gathering of the church. So starting on November 1st at 9 a.m., instead of meeting in our usual building at Daystar, we will be meeting in a building three times as large down the street, which will enable us to stay spread out during the service. The building is the local 399 Union Hall. It has tons of parking, extremely safe, and very clean. You know, in the long run, we desire to be back at Daystar so we can hone in on reaching the South Loop community with the gospel. But due to COVID, this building will serve us well during these colder months. You know, more details will be sent via email and be on the South Loop website this week. And let's also remember to continue in our worship through our giving, remembering that we give of our resources and finances because Jesus first gave it all to us. You can find more details on that on our website. And please let us know if you have any questions regarding things going on in the South Loop community. Let me pray. God, we thank you that we are able to gather together in worship, even if it's online. We thank you, God, that you have given us access to hear your word, to sing songs of praise. And so, God, I pray that in each living room, each, uh, each screen, each family, each uh, individual and roommates, God, that your spirit may be present with them, that you may speak to us, that you may encourage us, and that you may remind us of how powerful your word is and how it caused us to be transformed people for your sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand wherever you are? And I would like to ask parents, if your kids are somewhere else, gather them around the television now, around the computer screen. Uh, We are going to have a call to worship to start our morning. And then we are going to spend a handful of minutes singing praises to our God as a family, as a community. So please repeat this call to worship after me from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning. To declare your steadfast love in the morning. And your faithfulness by night. And your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy.
Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. I will wait on you. And I will trust. Shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I will wait on you. Oh, I will wait on you. And I will trust.
Amen. We praise you this morning, Father. We give you glory. We give you the honor that is due you in our lives, in our minds, and our hearts this morning, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now we're going to do a song geared more towards the kids, but we would love adults and children to participate together. There's going to be some actions to this song. I'm going to review them right now and then watch Mondisa throughout the song for the actions. This is a song that we debuted last week. It's a verse from the Bible, John 5, 24, a wonderful verse to know, a wonderful verse about the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation for us. So it goes like this. For God so loved, no, that's not it. That's John 3, 16. <clears throat> he who hears my word, he who hears my word and believes from your mind and then you hold it fast, you believe it. He who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and will not come into judgment but is passed from death into life. Let's sing it together. He who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and will not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. He who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and will not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. He who hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and will not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And let's respond to that verse by singing to God praise for his great salvation in our lives, by accepting the truth of that verse for us and all that it means for ourselves. Oh, 
Lord Jesus Christ, you are wonderful. You are Lord of all. We give you praise this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. Amen. 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 Church, today we will be continuing in our series in Romans, and we will be in Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, a very well-known passage in Scripture to many of you. So turn there with me in your phones, in your Bibles, and let me start off by reading our passage for today. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. It reads, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, before I start, I want to invite the kids again to listen up. Give me five minutes. So please look up here and parents, do your best to help your kids look up here as well. And so kids, I just read our passage for today. But for you all, I want to talk more about verse 2, which reads, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By the way, that's a great memory verse for you to do with your parents. But what does God mean here? Well, let me bring up something. A plant, okay? A plant here. As you can see, it's quite big. It's quite beautiful. And it's kind of growing out of its pot. And the hope over time is that as you give it water and put it in the sunlight, it will continue to grow. And depending on what type of plant it is, it may grow a different kind of fruit or vegetable. It might even grow flowers. But what if I took this jar here and I stuck it on top of this plant. And so I made all the little leaves get stuck, if I can do this, in this plant. And I just left it here and it was stuck there. What would happen to the stems and leaves of this plant? Yes, it won't grow. It will be conformed to this jar. And so it wouldn't be able to, as a beautiful plant, be able to transform, grow fruit, grow flowers. But it would be conformed and stuck to this jar. Kids, Jesus has given us new life because he loves us and died for us. If we believe in him, we are promised new life. And so he wants us to live and grow in his love like a beautiful plant. But the world, the like this jar, it doesn't want us to grow. It wants us to conform to what the world wants us to look like. And it actually stunts our ability to grow like Jesus wants us to. The world wants us to be popular, but Jesus wants us to be faithful and humble. The world wants us to be rich and wealthy, but Jesus wants us to be generous to others, especially the poor. The world wants us to think about just me, but Jesus wants us to think about serving and loving others. Jesus wants to transform us and to set us free to live abundantly like a beautiful plant that produces much fruit and grows outside of the conformities of the world. So kids, today I'm calling you, I'm asking you to not conform to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so today, and parents, keep your kids accountable. Before you go to bed today, take some time and read a word in Scripture. Maybe your Bible story book with mom or dad. And talk about how you can live by not conforming to the many things the world wants us to be, but to be transformed to live how Jesus wants us to be. Let me pray for you kids. Thank you for loving us, Jesus. I pray for each child that you allow the lies of this world to not conform them to do what the world wants them to look like or to be like or to act like, but that you, through the power of your spirit, may transform them to live in your love and to live for you. Help them daily, God, we pray. And now, Lord, as we move into digging a bit deeper for um, the many adults and the parents who are listening here right now, God, I pray that your word may sink deeper into our hearts and that we may not be just hearers of your words, but that we may be doers for your sake and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, adults, you got a small preview of our text today, but let me go a little bit deeper, and I'm going to challenge you a little bit more in our text. So we're in Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, and as, you, as I mentioned before, it's a very well-known passage. But let me start with the fifth word of our text, therefore, therefore. That therefore is probably suited to be probably better suited to be placed at the beginning of the sentence because Paul uses this one word not to just transition from chapter 11 to chapter 12, 
but to transition from everything Paul has talked about through chapters 1 through 11. In Roman, which is the gospel story. Paul is recounting the gospel story. In Romans chapter 1 through 3, Paul shares bad news with us. That all humanity, including you and me, were under the dominion of sin and death. We were unrighteous and doomed to suffer God's wrath, which was eternal death. Romans 3.11 reminds us that no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. But in chapters 4 through 5, we hear good news. The answer to our sins and, and our problems. In Romans 5 verses 8 through 9, it says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, his perfect righteousness is given to us who believe, who put our faith in him. We are saved by his grace and that is a gift from him. Praise God. Then as a result, he, Paul keeps going. In chapter 6 through 8, we see the hope. Once saved, we are no longer then slaves to sin, but we are united with Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit living in us. We, became, we become heirs with Christ and we celebrate and we praise that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? You can say amen at home. Go ahead. And for the past few weeks, we went over chapters 9 through 11. And there we were reminded that Paul needed to address his own Jewish people, the Israelites. That amidst all that they've been through, God was and is still sovereign over all. And he is merciful to all that he chooses. For Romans 11:32, it says, For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. The entire story of chapters 1 through 11 is that God has shown incredible, sacrificial, abundant, life-altering mercy to wicked and undeserved sinners like you and me. That no matter what we thought, said, or done, if we call on the name of Jesus and believe wholly in him, God's mercy and grace doesn't just erase our sins, it transforms us to be like him, to be like Jesus and enjoy an eternal relationship with our Father. That is the gospel story. That is good news, church. So there you go. In that one word in our text, therefore, it incorporates the entirety of the gospel story in the context for the rest of our verses today. Don't worry, don't worry, I won't spend that long on every single word in this passage. So now, what does Paul say next? And he says this in verse 1. He says, I appeal to you, which other translations say, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And as you can see here, this verse marks the key transition of the entire book of Romans. Here Paul moves from the theological side of the gospel in chapters 1 through 11 and he moves to the practical or ethical side of the gospel through chapter 12 through 15. Or I like how Douglas Moo, uh, a commentator, puts it. This transition is where we see what God has given to us shift to now what we are now to give to God. Because only... Only when we properly remember who God is and what he has done for us will it lead naturally and logically to be doing what he says and what he commands us to do. Church, hear this. If we have been given the greatest mercy, the greatest gift of all, it must lead to true and total worship. It should lead to transformation. So for today, what I want to do is just set the foundation or the thesis for the rest of the practices given through chapter 12 through 15. 
by walking through Paul's main charge and the two ongoing events, or act, not events, but activities that are carried out to fulfill that charge. So let me start with the charge. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The first thing I want you to notice is how Paul calls Christians, calls us to a holistic response. If you remember from the Old Testament here, the Israelites would make ongoing whole animal sacrifices over fire as an offering to God. With, whether to repent of their sins or give thanksgiving or praise to God. So Paul is drawing upon that same imagery and calling us to give our whole being, our very lives in worship to God. This isn't just a one-time act. But it's this ongoing commitment of daily coming to God with your entire being saying, Today, Lord, my life is yours. You know, this verse strongly re resembles Jesus' words in Luke 9, through 20, Luke 9 verses 23. When he says to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. God isn't asking us for a literal death here. He is asking for a whole life devotion, or as Paul puts it, our spiritual act of worship. So when Paul uses this language of worship, you know, sometimes you have this tendency to think or put worship in a box and limit it to just a Sunday experience or just singing songs or just studying the word in small group Bible study. That is one aspect of worship, but for Paul, worship involves everything. It involves how we parent our children or how we interact with our neighbors. It involves how we think and speak or how we steward our time and resources. It involves our decisions at work, our decisions in our health, and how we treat the least of these in our society. Notice, Paul doesn't use easy or comfy language here. The main imagery he gives is a whole animal being burned up on the altar. That is a life giving sacrifice. But if we were honest with ourselves, church, is that the kind of sacrifice you are presenting to God? Is that the kind of worship we are truly giving before our merciful God? Probably not. You know, and I'll be the first to confess that it is so difficult to offer all of me to God as a sacrifice in worship. Because if, if I'm honest with myself, I want to believe I offer God my first fruits, my very best. But honestly, I feel many times I'm just giving God my leftovers. And I don't know about you, but for me, the main reason I struggle to give God my all is because I am afraid of losing control over my life. I am a man that loves predictability. I like, I like to have my schedule set. I know exactly, to know what exactly I have to do for the day. I like to have my coffee in the morning, know what meals and what work looks like for that day. I like to have my kids in bed by 7 p.m. and I know exactly what our finances look like and where I'll be one year, five years, ten years from now. But now, with having two kids, COVID presenting uncertainties and limitations, and trying to plant a church in Hyde Park during COVID, I feel control slipping like water through my fingers. And I feel myself getting a little bit anxious, frustrated, and even fearful of all the unknowns before me. And the more control I don't have, sometimes the more I want to just grab on to control even tighter, especially areas where I know I can control. Like I get a tighter grip on my finances or on my health or on my kids, which I don't know why I try because that's pretty much impossible. I keep trying to grab on. But when I go to Jesus, when I go to him, and I, I hear three words. I hear, lay it down. Lay it down. He says, I became a living sacrifice for you so you can be a living sacrifice for me. I didn't die for only a part of you or so that you can control your life. No, I died for all of you. Church, what do you need to lay down 
so that you can present your bodies as a living sacrifice before God? What do you need to lay down so that you can present your bodies as a living sacrifice before God? You know, to wrap up verse 1, Paul is essentially saying to us as Christians, true worship requires everything. It requires everything, church. But the next question that comes up is, how? Noah, how do I worship with everything? And Paul, in verse 2, he gives us two ongoing activities that we must commit to daily applying in our lives. The first one is active and external. And it's the familiar one that I just went over with the kids. Do not be conformed to this world. You know, another way to say this, which I actually like very much, is don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. Very much like that plant and jar demonstration I gave to the kids earlier. It's, it's, it's do not let the world squeeze you into that mold. And, and what's the world's mold? Anything that is against or above the will of God. Anything that is against or above the will of God. You know, against is a bit more obvious here. You know, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, the world is primarily led by the rulers and authorities, cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil. And they promote these evil things like greed, oppression, materialism, racism, violence, pride, and so much more. But when I say above the will of God, these are subtle modes of the world where it may be a good desire that supersedes our whole life sacrifice before God. And these are the molds that I believe many of us have difficulty laying down. There is this mold of a picture-perfect American life where we desire a big and safe home, comfort and space and the crown molding in our house and good schools and all the bells and whistles. There is another mold of success where we desire this great job, great pay, great title, great vacation perks, and great admiration and respect from our peers. There is another mold where I know I struggle with, where it's this mold of comfort and security. It's where we desire predictability, have the best insurance policies, and increase our own safety net where we don't have to worry about anything in the future. There are other modes too of wealth, of happiness, of power, pleasure, individuality, tolerance, freedom, and more and more. And on the surface level, they're not wrong per se, but they can easily be above and supersede the will of God that he has for us. And so what Paul is saying here is he's saying actively resist the messaging and beliefs that are not centered on God's will on God's word and in his spirit. And with so much information quite literally at our fingertips, we need to be even more on guard of what desires are subtly being implanted in us. Be aware, Paul says. Do not conform to this world. And then the second ongoing activity Paul mentions goes deeper into how we are to proactively resist. He says... Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. The word transform, which is actually where we get the word metamorphosis, is only used two other times in scriptures here. First, when Jesus was transfigured or transformed on, um, on the mountain uh, with Peter, James, and John. And second, in 2 Corinthians 3.16, when Paul talks about how we are to be transformed in the likeness of Christ. Both times the transformation signifies where there is a real and lasting change of becoming different and better than before. And the example is always attributed to the likeness of Jesus. So Paul here, he says this transformation begins to happen when we actively renew our mind. And our mind is not just referring to our intellectual thoughts, but it's more towards our desires and our own personal wills. You know, if we go back to Romans 1.28, Paul writes how humanity's rejection of God resulted in God giving them over to their worthless minds. But now, if you are saved by grace and given the power of the Spirit in you, your minds can go through a lifelong reprogramming process by submitting to the practices that transform our minds to God's ways and not our ways. 
this transformation also, it, it doesn't take place overnight. But it's an ongoing daily decision to renew your mind through God's word, his will, and his spirit. Spiritual transformation cannot be microwaved. It takes time. It takes intentionality. But let's get more practical. How does this look like day after day? We must go to our spiritual disciplines. To our spiritual disciplines. You know, if you don't know what, what those are, in short, spiritual disciplines are habits of devotion that are designed to develop, grow, and strengthen believers in their walk with Jesus Christ. It's to develop, grow, and strengthen believers in our walk with Jesus Christ. These are habits that we have in our lives. And Christian leaders like Dallas Willard and Richard Foster, they share how there are two types of spiritual disciplines. There are disciplines of letting go, and there are disciplines of activity, which actually fit very well in our text for today. You know, disciplines of letting go are practices that allow us to relinquish something in order to gain something new. Practices like solitude, silence, fasting, or sacrificial giving allow us not to be conformed to the world in terms of the areas like busyness, our consumerism, our greed. Then there are disciplines of activity, which are practices that nurture our souls and strengthens us for each day. Practices like prayer, studying God's word, fellowship with other believers, and worship allow us to regularly renew our minds and to be transformed. These disciplines are essential to our transformation. But remember, they are only the means. They are not the end. The reason our text says, be transformed, which is a passive verb, is that only God through the Holy Spirit can transform us and renew us. Our responsibility is to be faithful in these disciplines to give space for God to work in us. You know, pursuing spiritual disciplines is very much like gardening or farming. As a gardener or farmer, there is much work to see growth. You have to get good soil, plant the seeds, water it, make sure it gets good sunlight, create rails to protect it from critters and different animals. And to help it grow, you, you clear the weed and much more every single day. But at the end of the day, can the gardener or farmer ever, ever control the actual growth of the plant or the fruit? No. Every sweat dropped and weed pulled may help that plant grow, but the ultimate source of growth comes from the seed, comes from, from God itself. And in the same way, we must be actively doing our spiritual disciplines so that we do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Church, faith takes effort. We cannot passively sit on our couch and expect our lives to be transformed by the gospel. We have to stop making excuses of being so busy to neglect these essential practices of our faith. Because if we do not take this command seriously, you will not grow in your faith. You know, I wish I could spend more time on these spiritual disciplines. But I, what I actually want to do is recommend a few books on spiritual disciplines. And if you want more information, more details, please email us or the pastors, elders, deacons, or anything. And we would love to resource you and share more about spiritual disciplines. But three books that I really recommend are uh, The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Or The Spirit of Disciplines by Dallas Willard. Or The Spiritual Disciplines Handbook by Adele Auber Cahoon. Great resources, great steps to begin to think of what spiritual disciplines you can begin even tomorrow, even this week. Church, please do not neglect, commit to your spiritual disciplines. Because as we finish up our text, if we commit to these daily, Paul says in the final section of our verses that we will be able to test and discern the good and perfect will of God. Because when we are so saturated with who God is and not conform to this world, our thoughts or our desires, our actions will slowly begin to morph in step with God's will 
in God's ways. Remember, his will is the same will that created us, that sent his son to die for our sins, that set us free and that is transforming us to become more like Jesus. That same perfect, pleasing and good will can be in us. Church, don't you want to know God's will for your life? Don't you want to confidently walk in step with God's ways? Don't you want to be able to accurately discern difficult circumstances in light of God's will? Then church, we must daily present our entire bodies, our minds and desires, our will as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God. We must not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We must proactively commit to the age-old spiritual disciplines daily. Even if it takes weeks, months, or years for growth, we must trust that as we continue to faithfully present our lives to God, that over time our will and desire will begin to not look like the fleeting desires of this world, but look more like God's pleasing and perfect will. Church, that is my prayer for you. My hope for each one of us. I know that many of you are in a season where life feels mundane or difficult or just uncertain and you just want to put all these things off or you don't feel like it's worth committing to these. But I want to encourage you, please do not neglect your intentional time with God. Grab a small group member to keep you accountable. Do it with your spouse. Do it with your roommate. Do it with your best friend. Please seek God because his word promises is that if we seek him with our whole heart, he will meet us. Let me close with this. You know, there, there are a few movies that have uh, made me shed a tear. Uh, and one of those movies is the movie Click. Now, I'm, I'm going to give the movie away here, so I apologize. But it's been out for 14 years, so you should be watching it anyway. So um, the premise of the movie is about a man named Michael played by Adam Sandler, who is an architect that often chooses work over family. Suddenly, he is gifted with this magical remote control where he can control reality much like a television. He begins to use this for his advantage at work and starts to fast forward through unwanted experiences. Arguments with his wife, house chores, or the length of time needed for his next promotion. And after a while, though, the remote begins to recognize his preferences and starts skipping through all the difficult and even important life experiences, turning his life into an endless autopilot. Though he finds himself rich and accomplished towards the end of the movie, he learns that his marriage ended in a divorce and his wife remarried, that his children grew up not having a relationship with their father, that he's actually obese and extremely unhealthy. And he also learned that his father had passed away. And though he tried to rewind to see that event, he realized that he was never present there. And so that memory was not in his memory bank. Finally, after two heart attacks and multiple surgeries, he recognized how he made a grave mistake only to tell his son not to neglect his family before passing away. And at this point, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of like, you're kind of tearing up here. You think the movie is over, but then it returns back to the Bed Bath & Beyond where he received this magical remote in the first place. And instead of taking it again, he decides to throw it away. He was given a second chance. Church, as verse 1 reminds us, it is only by the mercies of God that each of us in Christ have been given a second chance. We have a second chance to not sit passively by by only trying to fast forward the things that we want to see or don't want to see. We have a second chance to actively present our lives fully to God, being transformed by the renewal of our minds. We have a second chance to live into the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Church, don't let it pass you by. Day by day, patiently and intentionally, 
Let's give our lives as a living sacrifice to our merciful and gracious God. Amen? Amen, church. Let me pray. God, this verse, this passage is challenging. To offer our whole lives as a living sacrifice for you, for your worship, and for your glory. I pray, God, that instead of seeing this as a daunting task, may we see this in light of the great mercy and sacrifice that you laid before us first, God. And may we, with joy and with jubilation, be able to give our full lives for you in worship and everything that we say and do in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities, and in this world, God. May we be transformed people who live for your sake and your glory, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's close our service with a benediction. Would you please stand? This is from 2 Peter 3. Repeat each line after me. May you grow in the grace and knowledge. May you grow in the grace and knowledge. Of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. To him be the glory. Both now and to eternity. Both now and to eternity. Go in peace, South Loop. You are loved.